Hello, my name is Vivek Vedya. I'm one of the founders of Superset Startup Studio, and I'm here to talk to you about privacy engineering. Before we delve into the nuances of privacy engineering, let me just share my brief background with you. Uh, I went to I2 Delhi and the University of Denver, did a master's in math and CS, after which I've exclusively worked as a serial entrepreneur. My entrepreneurial journey started at a company called RAP, where I was the first engineer, became the CTO in 2005, and RAP got acquired by Microsoft in early 2008. I spent a year or so at Microsoft, after which I left, and then started a company called Crux with, my, with the RAP CEO, uh, Tom Chavez. He and I worked on Crux for about seven years. Crux was acquired by Salesforce in November of 2016. After the acquisition of Crux, we wrote a book uh, called, called Data Driven Marketing. And after we left Salesforce, we started a startup studio called Superset, where we found, fund, and build data driven software companies. There are three companies in particular that I want to highlight from the studio that I'm heavily involved in. One is a company called Catch, which, is, which builds privacy and security software. Another is a company called Habu, which builds uh, data collaboration software for the enterprise. And the third one is a company called Markov ML, which builds an enterprise MLOps platform. Before we uh, delve into the engineering aspects of privacy, let's just take a step back and think about how we got here. There are three broad trends that have led to us being in the situation that we are in vis-a-vis -vis privacy today. Uh, and these trends have kind of been unfolding for the last 10, 12 years or so. The first one is public cloud maturity. AWS started off as a, as a mainstream service in late 2009 or so. Crux was actually one of the first uh, companies to exclusively build on the, uh, on the public cloud. Since then, Google Cloud and Azure have also come out and become really mature solutions for public cloud. That, is, that has resulted in companies, big, medium size and small, adopting the cloud at a widespread space, uh, pace. The second is the abundance of data platforms. I've listed a few over here. These should sound familiar, look familiar to many of you in the audience. Uh, from key value stores and distributed data stores like Redis, Cassandra, Dynamo, DynamoDB, to blob storage like Amazon S3 and Azure blob storage, all the way to uh, custom analytics platforms like Snowflake, Redshift, and Google BigQuery, us engineers have been trained now to pick the right tool for the job. We don't just store all of our data in one database like an Oracle or SQL Server, as used to be the case 15, 20 years ago, now we have a plethora of uh, data platforms that are used to manage the data that comes into our, our systems. The third trend has, has been all of the data breaches that we read about, whether it's the Cambridge Analytica scandal to the Equifax scandal in the US to the data breaches of Yahoo, British Airways, et cetera, all these companies are now being fined by the respective jurisdictional uh, committees in, in organizations in their countries. And that has led to uh, a, a large swath of privacy regulations coming up. It started with GDPR in uh, 2018, and then California <clears throat> passed CCPA uh, soon after. And then now there is also talk about a privacy data protection bill in India as well. So these privacy regulations do, are a response to the large uh, uh, scale data collection and data usage that has happened through the large number of data platforms that are available along with the maturity of the public cloud. What is privacy engineering then? Why do we need it? Uh, so privacy engineering is the uh, practice of embedding privacy into systems by building tools and processes that apply protections to personal data. As more and more data starts to get collected, as more and more data breaches happen, regulators have stepped in and defined regulations like GDPR that, that have to be complied with by people like us who build data management systems. So today we're gonna to focus more on the tools, less on the processes. And the tools lead us to this new emerging space called privacy enhancing technologies. These are technologies that allow end users, so 
consumers to interact with our uh, with software that we might that we might produce. These technologies allow end users to protect the privacy of their personal data while allowing us, the builders of these systems, to use the data in a responsible manner. The privacy enhancing technologies fall into two broad categories. There are soft privacy technologies and hard privacy technologies. Today we'll be focusing on soft privacy technologies, specifically in the area of privacy compliance, consent management, and rights fulfillment. Hard privacy technologies is, is perhaps a topic for, for another talk, or, which is all about zero third-party trust, VPNs, technologies like secret ballots, which are used in elections, uh, et cetera. Uh, there, are, there are dedicated systems that build these hard, part, hard, hard privacy technologies. Today, we're gonna focus on soft privacy technologies. So before we, before we delve into the specifics, let's just think about what, what we could use as a framework for what I'm calling privacy-centric data management. The, the framework starts with purpose. Why are we collecting the data that we need to collect? What is the purpose? What are the purposes that we are gonna collect data for? The second, from the purpose now comes collection. What data is being collected for the purposes that we need to collect it for? Do we have the legal basis for collecting the data that we're collecting? Do we have to collect everything that we're collecting or, we, or can we be specific in the amount of data that we collect depending on what purposes we need it for? From collection, we move on to processing. What are the different ways in which we process data? Are we respecting user consent and user choices that we provided to users when we told them we were collecting data for specific purposes. And then finally, access. Who has access to the data? What data access policies govern the usage of data, not only by humans, but by systems as well? From our framework come two principles, two core principles for privacy-centric data management, and they are consent and rights. Consent is all about offering users the choice to control what data is being collected and how it can or should not be used by the entity that is collecting the data. Rights is all about giving users the right to control what happens with their data, the right to access, demand that, hey, please give me all of the personal data that you have about me. Portability is another right which allows users the right to obtain their data in a portable format for reuse in a different context. And then finally, the right to erasure. This allows users the right to request that all of their collected and processed personal data be deleted permanently. So these are the three rights that any business that is dealing with personal data has to provide users uh, in order to comply with privacy regulations like GDPR. The, the first part of this, which is all about user choice is consent. Uh, and consent, there are two, there are two uh, uh, models for consent. There is opt-in and opt-out. Opt-in involves obtaining explicit user consent before data is collected and processed. And opt-out, it requires you to not obtain explicit consent before collecting or processing data, but you do need to allow users to the ability to revoke consent for processing. So this is, you know, uh, this you may be familiar with, with all of the, hey, I want to opt out of email marketing. There, you didn't have to give explicit consent for people to send email to you, but you can opt out of them sending you future emails. Contrast that with GDPR, and when you visit a website, if you're in Europe and you visit a website, you will be shown a consent form. Contrast that with, with opt-in, which is prevalent in uh, privacy regulations like GDPR, where you have to obtain explicit user consent before you can process, uh, collect or process and process personal data. So we're gonna use an example. Uh, to illustrate all of these ideas, we're going to use an example, an example website. It's, it's a live website. It's a fictitious website, but it's a, it's a real website. It's called Ex Exonic, and it's your neighborhood financial advisor. 
It provides various financial advisory services to people like you and me uh, who can sign up and, and get advice, get, get paired with a, with a financial advisor, et cetera. So as you might imagine, this, this company Exonic uh, will, be, will have uh, the need for collecting your data for many purposes. And I've listed five over here. They, they may need your data. Uh, they may need to process your personal data for analytics, which, is, which gives them uh, the ability to understand how, how many people are visiting my site, how many people are interested in a specific, specific product, how many people expressed interest in a given product but didn't, didn't purchase it, et cetera. The second is personalization, which is when you go to the website, they may show you personalized content. Now they have to process your personalized personal data in order to share that personalized those personalized recommendations with you. Uh, so they need they need to get your consent for that. The third purpose may be email marketing, where when you register with them, they may send you. Uh, promotional emails that, that get you to sign up for one, a new product that they, are, uh, that they are going to launch. Or they might get you to sign up for an email newsletter. They, they'll get your email address and add you to a, an email newsletter list. And so every week, every month, what have you, you might get email promotions from them. The fourth purpose would be targeted advertising. Uh, Axonic uh, might want to retarget you. You visit the Axonic website, you were looking at a product, but you didn't purchase. You go to the New York Times or Times of India and you're reading the news, suddenly you see an ad from, uh, from Exonic. That th they need to process your personal data, cookies are personal data. And in order to do that, they have to explicitly get consent for you. The purpose would be targeted advertising. And the final purpose would be data sales. They, uh, Exonic may share uh, your data with their third party partners and, and other uh, prov service providers who may recommend or, or uh, offer you services that might be of interest to you. So that data sharing or data sales uh, cannot happen unless you give explicit consent for that. So once, uh, once you've understood that this is the framework we're dealing with, let's look at what the a consent form might look like and how do we collect and store consent for our fictitious website, Exonic. So when you go to Exonic and you are browsing from Europe, where remember it's consent opt-in, you, ha you have to be shown this consent form that, that's on the left side of my screen over here. So you see all of the different purposes and there are more than the five that I listed in the previous slide. There are eight or nine different purposes over here that Exonic is requesting you to provide consent for. You'll notice that all of the uh, options are turned off by default. So you, and this is what I mean by opt-in, the user has to explicitly consent to their data being collected and used for each purpose listed over here. So if you go and check in a few boxes, let's say you're okay with analytics and personalization and product research, but none of the else, you would check the analytics box, the personalization box and the product research box. That's how the end user experience looks like when, you, when users are asked to provide consent. Now let's look at what the backend might look like. Let's say you are the privacy engineer who's responsible for now storing this consent in, uh, in the database. Remember that just showing the consent form is not enough. You actually have to store and process and use and enforce this consent in your various data processing uh, jobs and activities. So I've shown two uh, examples over here or, or two options for storing consent. One is what I'm calling the normalized version where each row uh, for where all the consent for all of the purposes for a given user is recorded in each in, in one row. So at any given point in time for every user that has or has not provided consent, there is exactly one row in the user consent table. The second option is the denormalized option, which is you there is one row per purpose. So the second row, the second option is a bit more scalable because it allows you to keep track of how consent has changed over time. Uh, but you can use either of these options. There are trade-offs and you should work with your legal teams to figure out what, how you want to 
process this consent and what your company's privacy posture is vis-a-vis -vis consent before deciding on the normalized option versus the denormalized option. Once you have uh, once you have stored consent, how do you make it so when it comes to processing and enforcing consent? Again, let's go back to the simple analytics purpose that we had discussed earlier, where you as a developer of Exonic, your business user are, are your business users are asking you, hey, can you help me understand how many people come to our website or our various websites in the last 30 days? So the SQL query on the left, by the way, these are all canonical examples. I'm not necessarily suggesting that this should be done using SQL or not. You can choose to do so if you want, but SQL is the best and the easiest mechanism by which to convey these ideas. So I'm using SQL as the, uh, as the means or the, the language in which I write these, these processing jobs, so to speak. So if you look at the left-hand side of my screen, uh, you will see a SQL query that gives you the to, uh, count of distinct users broken down by site uh, as pulled from an event table, uh, a user event table, which records different things like page views and clicks and conversions, et cetera. Uh, now this, the query on the left does not take consent into account. It is including the data for all the users, regardless of whether they consented for the analytics purpose or not. The two queries on the right, however, do take consent into account. As you can see in the denormalized version, we pull out the highlighted part uh, in purple, shows you the, the way to pull out the most recent uh, consent for that purpose by user. And then we join that with our events table to figure out, oh, let's only look at users who have consented to their personal data being used for analytics. The normalized query looks similar where we don't have to do that most recent uh, 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 logic because there is exactly one row per user in the user consent table. And remember that by default, our posture was if the user, if a record, if a, if a row for a user doesn't appear in the consent table, we treat that user as not having consented to that purpose, which is why we can do an inner join over here and we don't do an outer join in the uh, in any of these in any of these queries. So that's how we that's a very that's a simple example of how we should be enforcing consent down at the data processing layer where we are uh, leveraging and reading the consent that was captured through the consent uh, module that I showed you earlier. And we're actually making it so and enforcing it in, uh, in, in, our, in our analytics layer as we compute these statistics for how many people visit, the, visit our various sites. The second thing that I wanna show you is how do we process data subject rights? Remember, there were three rights that we had to uh, uh, support. One was access, one was portability, and one was erasure. So for this, I'm going to use another table that uh, uh, is tracked or, or is, is managed by Exonic, our fictitious company. Because we are tracking uh, personal data, the table on the left is a, is a very simple example of, of a user data table that we may have which tracks users' gender, age range, their household income, and their status, whether they're active, dormant, or, uh, or, or churn. Uh, there is also a uh, soft delete column where we can, we can, which we can use to mark the user as deleted without actually deleting the row for, uh, for the user. Now, in order to fulfill data subject rights, and let's look at the erasure one, because I think it's, it's a, a simple one to motivate, User comes into our site, fills out a form and says, delete my data. They give us their email address because we have to have a means of identifying them in our database. And using that email address, we can delete their data from our user data table. And the query on the top is a very, is a canonical example of how we might, uh, how we might do that. Then we deleted the entire row from, uh, from that user data table for the email address that was specified to us. Now, it may be the case 
that our legal team or our accounting team or our user management team says, no, 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 we shouldn't delete the data. Imagine this, this table that we have is actually a transaction table and we're storing the uh, uh, amount that each user has spent with us to purchase various products. Now we can't delete that users, the, the, all the records that correspond to that user because then our total revenue numbers will not foot for, the, for purposes of accounting and auditing. So in those cases, we might use techniques like obfuscation, which is the second block in the middle, which, which allows us to uh, not delete, but effectively obfuscate and anonymize the data for that user who submitted the, the erasure DSR to us. So here you'll see I've, I've hashed the email address to an unknown value. I've used an anonymous value for gender, age range, household income, and customer status. And then I soft deleted that record from, uh, from the table. So there is no way now for this user or anybody to come in and get, supply me the same email address for this user and get this data because that email address now does not exist in my, uh, in my database. The access and portability uh, uh, path is somewhat straightforward for our, for our canonical example here. It's a simple SQL query that we run from our user data table and that pulls out all of the records uh, for, for this user and returns them back to the user. Note that I haven't, uh, in, in, this, in this conversation, I haven't talked about how we make the data available to the user. There are various options for doing that. You can set up a data access portal. You can uh, compile all of the data, put it on an S3 bucket and send a link to the users because you have their email address. Uh, you can include steps like identity, identity verification. In fact, you should uh, because they become important because otherwise I can request your data and you can request mine. That's not what, uh, uh, that's not what the access and portability uh, rights are all about. So several different extensions you can make to this, to this core idea of using uh, techniques like erasure or obfuscation to implement uh, the various data subject rights. So you might be wondering now with these examples, why is this so hard, right? Uh, all of the data, if all of our data is sitting in one RDBMS, like I've shown in this graph over here, in this picture over here, why is there such a big, why do people make such a big deal about it, right? Uh, you can have data from various different systems coming in, all processed, massaged, managed, transformed using various ETL layers, but ultimately all of it is going into one database on top of which we're building all these applications, right? This doesn't look that hard. But now remember, going back to how we got here, that's not how we designed our system. We picked the best tool for the job. So for our raw events, we dumped them all in Amazon S3 because we wanted the flexibility to use those, those raw events or raw log files for future use or and use cases that we hadn't thought of uh, right now. So that goes in unstructured blob storage. Remember, there's personal data in that unstructured blob storage. We process user application data. The CRM table that we saw perhaps lives in an RDS database because we want to respect transactional semantics for that data. That's another place now where we have personal data. The personalization that we provide on the Axonic website needs access to a real-time user data store where we might be storing segments or, or attributes or traits that the user might belong to. All of those go in a key value store like Amazon DynamoDB that also now has personal data. And finally, the uh, example queries that I showed when we were discussing consent the, uh, the analytics use case or analytics purpose, all of that data, all of those queries run on top of a data warehouse that we've designed using Amazon Redshift. And all of the raw data along with transactions and CRM, et cetera, is processed and transformed into a data warehouse that can then be used for querying to answer the various analytics queries that our business may have uh, to understand how the business is doing what kind of uh, traffic are we getting, et cetera. 
Amazon Redshift or our analytics data warehouse also now contains personal data. So see how the see how complex the problem has become now. We've moved from one database where, where perhaps which we can perhaps query to understand all of the tables that exist and which tables have personal data. Now we've moved into four different types of data platforms or data storage systems that might contain uh, personal data. And all of them have a different storage model. Amazon S3 has blob storage. You think in terms of buckets and files and keys and folders, et cetera. RDS is all tables and databases and columns, et cetera. Uh, DynamoDB, same thing, but it's a key value store. You can't scan it like you would uh, uh, a relational database. And then finally, Redshift is closer to uh, the relational database, but still the access patterns are different. The schemas are different. The table names are different. The model which we use to store the data is different. So your, your simple task of fulfilling a DSR, DSR request, right? whether it's access, portability, or erasure, now needs to query four types of systems as opposed to one. And you might not even know where all of these, uh, where the personal data is spread out across all of these four systems. So what you need in order to fulfill your DSR request efficiently and effectively is a data catalog that tells you where are all of the uh, sources of personal data, which you need to query and or modify when data subject rights requests come in from your users. So to, to summarize, there is a four-step process that you can follow to embed practical privacy engineering into all of, your, uh, all of your data management systems. The first one is you work with your legal teams to define the purposes for which you need to collect uh, data. And the important thing over there is for you to ensure that you have the right legal basis for ensuring for each personal data attribute that you're collecting. The second, as we just discussed, is a, a searchable data catalog of data assets across all of your data platforms. SQL, NoSQL, blob storage, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, the whole gamut. You need a data catalog that sits on top of all of your data systems that gives you insight into where do you have personal data. Now, a related thing over here is that your data catalog should be able to classify and assign labels to all the personal data that is stored in these systems. Your SQL database may have 15 tables, but only three out of the 15 contain personal data. Your data catalog should be able to tell you that. The third step is implementing a consent management system. Now you can build this yourself or there are plenty of solutions out there in the market which you can, which you can uh, purchase. The important thing over here is that the consent management system needs to be aware of the jurisdiction, the, geography, the geographical jurisdiction in which it is operating. And so uh, the treatment for GDPR is different from the treatment from CCPA, right? That's what I mean by jurisdiction aware. And then your consent management system, the job doesn't end with just capturing the consent. As we've seen, you need to be able to make it so by processing and enforcing consent in the various data processing jobs that implement all of the purposes for which data is used. And then finally, have a scalable automated process for DSR fulfillment. Leverage your data catalog, leverage the insight that you get from your data catalog to fulfill DSR requests using code and automation and not humans and ticketing. Thank you.